In the Old Testament book of Isaiah, there are four songs written to describe God's servant. Who is God's servant? What does God's servant do? Join me today as we look at the first of these songs in Isaiah, Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 9, as we see the responsibilities of God's servant. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 42. That's where we'll be today. Isaiah 42. We want to start a new series. We're going to call Servant Songs. There are four songs in the book of Isaiah that describe the servant of God. We did this not long ago in a little Bible study, a little discipleship group that I'm a part of. And as we studied through those, I thought this would be a great sermon series. The more I, I thought about it, the more I thought that it would be relevant and helpful for us as we think about um, serving the Lord in, in the new year. It would be a great way to start the year off. These are four through Isaiah 42, through Isaiah 53. You find four of them. And, and they're unique. They're different in their tone in the sense that they describe different things about the servant of God. But they're very similar in, in some of the language that's used and some of the thoughts that's used. So they're, they're often grouped together and, and we think of them together. But as I say, they're different. They're different in, in the different aspects that they share about the, about the servant of God. And they are told from different points of view. For instance, like the first and the, um, the first and the last one are in the third person. Today what we're going to read is we're going to read the servant of God is being described, right? The servant of God is someone else, an outside speaker. The Lord is describing the servant of God, right? But, but in the middle two and two and three, those songs, it's the, from the voice of the servant himself that's speaking. So like I said, there are some differences, but they're all grouped together. And today, what I want us to do is, I want us to, as we, if we were to read through these, a question that becomes apparent in which we need to establish right off is who is the servant of God? And so the song that we'll look out today is going to talk about the revelation of the servant. It's going to reveal to us who the servant is, right? When I got my cell phone, my cell phone number, how many ever years got, I was late to the cell phone game, but when I finally got one, I got this number, and um, I would get some texts. My phone number used to belong to this girl. Her name was Emery, and I used to get texts from people early on, right after I got that number changed. People would send me a message, and I knew it, it wasn't for me or whatever, and I would say, you know, uh, I think, you know, this is a new, new number. I think you've got the wrong person here, and they would send me a message back as, is this Emory? I would say, no, no, it's not Emory. You know, you've got the wrong number or whatever. So one day, um, a while into this, I got a text message. Think you have the wrong number. So my reply, is this Emory? And a devious thought went through my brain. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, it is. Who is this? <laughs> I knew you would like this. And... I, I started doing that, and I just pretended to be Emory as long as it would go. Anybody that texted, I would just pretend to be Emory, and I found out so much about her. I found out <laughs> where she went to high school. I found out what sports she played. I figured out where she worked. I figured out all these things about her, and Emory must have been really pretty because all these people were boys, and they all wanted to, you know, they were, they were sending me messages wanting to, you know, reconnect with Emory. And I, you could say, David, that's awful. You should not have done that. You're right, it is hilarious. But my thinking was, these, this number has been changed for a while. So one, these people are not close to Emory because if they were close to her, they would have her new number, see? So these were people, guys, that she had met before her number changed. That may have been the reason why she changed her number. I don't know. 
And she, her number changed, and they didn't know it, and they were just whatever else. And so I started this back and forth. It became a game, and I was having to keep up. I was having to go back and read the other text, the, the rest of the text messages to see what we had talked about before so that I didn't, because I was pretending. I was pretending to be a high school girl, and it was, it was, a, it was a fun game. And then it became overwhelming. It just became too much, and I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. There were too many, I had too many I had too many lies I was juggling in the air, and I couldn't keep up with it. And so finally, every one of those conversations I had to end with, I had to admit, I had to fess up and say, like, this is not Emory. And some people got really mad or whatever else, but (laughs) it's neither here nor there. It's neither here nor there. We're all laughing about this because this is a real-life case of mistaken identity. And you've, if you've watched sitcoms, if you've watched movies, if you have seen it play out in real life somehow, a case of mistaken identity can be funny, right? But I'm going to tell you, if we're going to properly interpret, if we're properly going to see the application of these songs in Isaiah, there cannot be uh, this crisis of identity, Right? can't be a mistaken identity that we attach to the servant of God. We must get that right because if we don't get it right, it will give us all kinds of problems in the interpretation of what falls out at the end and it will help us to, it will, it will keep us from being able to apply these songs to our life every day. Let's read this first song together in Isaiah 42 where we see the servant of God revealed Isaiah 42, 1 begins, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Who is the servant of God? It'll be a while before we get to the outline, okay? So just know we're going to walk through all this together. And then once we establish the servant, then we'll walk through this text. Who is the servant of God? There's lots of opinions about that. Some people say that when they read these songs, and let me say, these are all people who believe the Bible, okay? I'm, I, these are all people that, that believe the Bible. It's just different ter- interpretations of it. Some people would tell you that the servant of God mentioned in these songs is the nation of Israel. Here's the idea. The idea is is that God came to the nation of Israel. He gave them his law. He established a relationship with them through this covenant. And the idea was is that Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations. Israel, the nation of Israel, was supposed to be the servant of God. If you think about that and you look at all the pagan nations that were around Israel, they worshipped, you know, little statues or nature objects or whatever. And here was the people of Israel who were serving the one true God who had this relationship with him and they were to be an example. It was to show these other pagan nations, they were to look to Israel, see this relationship, and it it was to be a means of drawing these other nations into a relationship with the one true God. And so some people look at this, and they say that Israel is who's being described here. I don't believe that. You can see that. And if you were to make a case for something else other than, other than who I'm going to tell you the servant is, I think that that's, that's probably one of the best arguments, you know. But here's the problem with that. When you read through Isaiah, 
a huge theme in the book of Isaiah is that Israel fails in their role as the servant of God. They were to be a light to the nations, but you know what they did? They worshiped idols too. They were supposed to be distinct and different, but you know what they did? They married all these other people who had totally different beliefs, and they adopted their beliefs instead of drawing them to the Lord. Israel was a problem in this. Some say that it was um, that the servant of God being described in these songs is King Cyrus, who was a Medio Persian emperor. And, and what happened there is that people would say that because, you know, the Israel, this is written at a time when the Israelites had been taken captive by the Babylonians. They had been taken away, many of them, into captivity and slavery in Babylon. It had been taken physically from Jerusalem and Judah. And it was under King, after the uh, Medio Persian Empire defeated the Babylonians, King Cyrus on the throne allows the children of Israel to go back. Into, the, into their home. And so some people see this as that, that King Cyrus is the servant of God, the one that God used to free the prisoners, free those who were in, enslaved in Babylon and to take them back into the land. So that's where some people get that idea. Some people believe that the servant of God is Christ himself. And they would say, this is where I'm going to take us in this. I believe that the servant of God is Christ himself. When you see some of the things that are described and how it is described, some people say this points and looks ahead to Christ. Franz Dalich, is in, when he writes about this, he kind of follows the idea that it could be many of these things. There are many people that look at these, these songs and they say, okay, yes, it applies to Israel, but it also applies to Christ. That's what Franz Dalich was intending when he wrote this. The conception of the servant of Jehovah is, as it were, a pyramid of which the base is the, whole pe is the people of Israel as a whole. The central part is Israel according to the Spirit. In other words, those who are believers in Christ, they're like the, all in the nation and then this believing remnant, right? And then the summit is the person of the mediator of salvation who arises out of Israel. And so he would say that there's multiple layers to this um, symbolism and that the servant of God is, is multiple things. But I'm going to tell you, when you read these passages, it doesn't seem that the servant of God is a people as much as it is an individual. And we've got to land on the right individual. If you were to say that the idea here is, is that it is Israel... God chose Israel, yes, but a huge theme in the book of Isaiah is, is that the nation of Israel failed as to, to, to be the light to the world. The, the nation of Israel failed to be the servant of God, and so he sends his son. If you were to just go with me to the previous chapter, if you have your Bible open in Isaiah 41, look at some of these things. You get some of this theme. In Isaiah 41, and there are multiple places we could go, but this was just right here, so I'm choosing this one. In Isaiah 41, verses 8 and 9, you see him choosing Israel. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you, whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you. I've not cast you off. That sounds like they're the servant of God, right? If that was all we had, that would seem like it would pair really well with this servant of God idea, right? But look at the next verse. He chose them not because of who they were, but because he wanted to work through them. He was to be their strength. Verse 10 says, fear not, Israel, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. But what we know about the history of Israel is they did not honor God. They cheated on him with idols. They cheated on him with other philosophies. They were not faithful to him. And if you were to continue through Isaiah 41, we don't have time to read it all, but if you go over to, to like verses 21 through 29, if you just skim through and look, there's this big discourse about idols. You wonder why that's mentioned maybe at the end of the passage we read today. It's because the nation of Israel 
instead of relying on God for strength, they turned to every other thing. They failed to be the light to the nation. When it came to being the solid witness that they were to be among the nations, they failed at that. And the book of Isaiah as a whole bears that theme out. God chose them, but this progression shows that while God intended the nation of Israel to be the light to the nations, he wanted them to publish good news about him. He wanted them to be an example, to their devotion to be in him, to call others to repentance. They failed at that. And so Christ comes, the true servant of God. There's this passage in Matthew, I think, that's a great argument for showing that Jesus is the servant that's mentioned in these passages. Now, maybe you go with the Franz Stalich approach and you say, well, it could be multiple things. So, yeah, it was Israel then, it's Jesus now. But you, you have to put Jesus in this equation somewhere, right? I believe that it's speaking of him. Matthew chapter 12, I think, proves this out. Matthew 12 and verse 15 it says, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all, and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, listen to these words, behold my servant whom I've chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I'll put my spirit upon him, he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles, he will not quarrel nor cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. You see what's being quoted here? Exactly what we read before in Isaiah 42. So Matthew 12 tells us that when these words in Isaiah 42, who's it talking about? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. The servant of God, if the servant of God is Jesus Christ, and these songs that are written were written so many years, hundreds of years before Jesus were born, 700 years or so before Jesus was born, these words were written in Isaiah. If that's true, they were written then, they're speaking about something that was yet to come. They were writing about Jesus' ministry when God would come in the flesh and dwell among us. This is the idea. And when you consider the totality of all these events, you're going to see as you read through some of these songs that it points. It seems to be talking about his ministry on earth and what he did to bring salvation. Some things are going to be pointing to, and some people would say that this refers to a time of a millennial reign, a time when, in an age to come when Jesus will establish a reign over the whole earth. Verses like verse 4, he, he will not grow faint or become discouraged till he has established justice in the earth, right? The idea that 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 all of the that he will make all things right that he's going to set all things right when he comes again right so in some ways we're seeing the fulfillment of this in some ways we have yet to see it but the idea is, is that when Jesus comes he will do what is necessary to bring salvation to men and to establish justice in the whole earth this idea that he will come and do that talks about this idea of him bringing justice to the nations. And Warren Wiersbe says in his commentary, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, one day there will be a glorious kingdom and God will bring justice to the nations. This idea that who he is, who is being described here, who is being revealed is the servant of God who will enact God's will here. Now you think for just a minute. Jesus Christ is the servant of God. If he's the servant of God and you and I are to be followers of Jesus Christ, there's this idea that you and I can learn something about how to serve God by seeing the way that he served. If Christ is the servant, if he came to, to not to be served but to serve, right? If he came to give his life as a ransom for many, if we are called to serve, how can we serve? Looking at his example, how can we learn something from him and then serve as he does? Today, we'll explore that through this idea of him being revealed in this passage. Let me give you three things I think you find in this passage just as we break it down together and walk through it. Let me give you a few things that I think will be helpful for us to see in Isaiah 42. First thing I want you to see in this passage is I want you to see the personality that's described. The personality 
that is described in this passage. Now, if you look at verses 1 through 4, this is where I'm going to focus. Notice there is not a physical description given. Because you and I are not to be like him in a physical way. There is a description that's given here, but it's not describing the servant in a physical way. It's describing the characteristics that that servant has. And there are some things here that are apt for me and you. Just look through the text with me. Just read it together. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen. My chosen. You know, there's a reason why that show we're going to watch tonight is named what it's named, right? Tonight, there's a reason why that's called what it is, right? And while... I believe that what's being described here in this word is the word chosen. If you have a King James, I think it's the word elect. And it's the idea that a thing is called for a particular purpose. It's set aside for a particular purpose, right? So if you think about Christ coming in that way, Christ came to this earth with a particular purpose, to seek and save those that were lost, to die for the sins of the world. He came with a purpose, chosen of God with a particular purpose, you and I, however, by the same measure, are chosen by God. We have been set aside for a particular purpose. The church of God has been set aside for that great commission that we talked about earlier, the mission to make disciples. God has chosen to use the church to publish the, nation, to publish the message to the nations. We have been chosen by him. And the fact that we were chosen for a purpose is given in numerous passages of Scripture. In Colossians 3 and verse 12, it tells us to put on then as God's chosen ones, those who put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if we have a complaint against one another, we forgive as the Lord has forgiven us, right? And above all these, we put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. It's giving a description of who we should be. And at the very beginning of that description, it says that we are to put this on as chosen ones of God. That's who we are. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9 tells us, you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are a people of his own possession that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into marvelous light. He's chosen us for a purpose. If you are a believer in Christ Jesus, you have been called and set apart for the purpose of proclaiming the excellencies, proclaiming his greatness to those, telling how he brought you from darkness to light. And the truth is, is that Miss Margaret, a hundred names, and seeing people saved in this coming year, it is, a, it is a daunting and overwhelming task. In fact, it is an impossible task left to ourselves. If he's called us for a purpose, he has also equipped us for the same purpose. And we'll have the tools and we'll have the resources and we'll have the words to say and we'll have the people to invite. We'll have the people to share with. Because if he's called us to a thing, he'll equip us for the thing. We are a chosen people and the servant of God is chosen. Keep going. I'm the, behold my servant whom I uphold my chosen in whom my soul delights. It's obvious when you read in scripture that Jesus, that, that Christ's ministry here on earth, his obedience to the Father was pleasing to the Lord, right? You see these passages in scripture. First off in his baptism in Matthew chapter, um, Matthew chapter 3. Remember, this is that beautiful picture. He's being baptized by John the Baptist. Here's the son, God the son, standing there in the river, dripping wet, having been baptized. You hear the voice of the father, the spirit of the, of the dove comes down, that right, that image, Matthew 3 and 17. And behold, that voice from heaven, the voice of the father said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. He delighted in Christ. Matthew 17 is that picture on the, is the, uh, the story of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration with, with Peter, James, and John where he reveals his glory, reveals his true self to them. And God once again declares that he's pleased with him. When he says, when he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and the voice from the cloud, this is God the Father, said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. 
The idea here is, is that he was pleased with the ministry of Christ because there was obedience. He was walking in and fulfilling the purpose that God had called him to. By the same token, he will be pleased with you and I in our ministry when the focus is him. Psalm 147 in verse 11 says, The Lord takes pleasure in those that fear him, those who hope in his steadfast love. If we attach ourselves to him, this is a thing that he is pleased with. He delights in, right? Notice in the next few verses there, um, in, ver- in the end of verse 1, I have put my spirit upon him. In Isaiah 42, you were chosen, soul delights in him, and I have put my spirit upon him. This is the idea that, back to the idea that if he's chosen us, he will equip us. And do you know how he's chosen us? He has put his Holy Spirit in us. When Jesus came and he's working in the power, uh, his, this divine power, divine power that people recognized. Because remember those teachers of the law, said, those people would hear it and they would say, oh, this one teaches as one with authority, as we have never heard it before. It stood out to them. It was unique. It was different. And the truth is, is that you and I, not operating in our own power, but as we've talked about with the victory and defeat messages that have preceded this one, walking in the power of the Spirit, living in the power of the Spirit, they see him and not us. He has equipped us. He has taken his mind and put it in us in order that we will be equipped and be sustained by God. Look at verse 2. This is kind of an interesting verse. He will not cry aloud. He will not lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. Here's the basic idea. When Christ came that first time, he was definitely a charismatic figure in the sense that people were drawn to him and wanted to hear him teach, right? But he wasn't flamboyant. It wasn't the idea that while all power was his, and he proclaimed that on a regular basis, right? There was also this idea that he, it was this humble authority that he had, that he showed, that he displayed. It's the same kind of, um, same kind of power that should be displayed in us. Matthew Arnold writing on this verse says, He shall not clamor, he shall not speak with a high vehement voice of men who contend. God's servant shall bring men's hearts to the word of God's righteousness and salvation by a gentle inward and spiritual message. The idea is despite the power he had, it was not flaunting his strength. He did not call 10,000 angels to take him off of the cross kind of idea, right? And the idea that we're not called, the 100 people that we share with this year, if they forget us, they should still remember him. We're not called to be flamboyant, to make our mark on this world, We're not called to be flamboyant. We're called to be faithful. And when that happens, he gets the glory. It's all directed toward him. We become a tool that he is using, a tool that he's working through, and that's the same idea here, right? I like verse 3, too. It's one of my favorite verses in the passage we read. Notice this characteristic of his personality. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. What does that mean? I think both of those images are a picture of those that are downtrodden, those that are beat up. So think for just a minute about the idea of that, um, uh, about the reed that is bruised. Think for just a minute, when you think about a reed, think about a stalk of grass or a blade of grass and imagine us walking through a field, right? And imagine our foot coming down on that blade of grass. It was standing up tall, reaching for the sky. We stand on it and we crunch it under our feet and that... When we walk away, that blade of grass, it might spring back, but it probably doesn't spring back quite as high as it did before. And it's bruised, and it might even turn wilted, and it might even limp over, right? This is the idea. Those that have been trodden, those that have been beaten down, those that are, have, have had a time of it, right? He, he, doesn't, he doesn't hurt this. He doesn't break that bruised reed, Right? In the same token, the smoldering wick. This is the idea of, uh, think about a candle when it gets to the end. Do you know how it'll flicker? 
It's the same kind of idea. For them, it may not have been a candle as much as it would have been an oil lamp where the wick had not been tended or trimmed, and there was a lot of ash that had to be burned at the end of that wick, and that it would flicker, and it would smolder. It would smoke in the room, and if you were using it to write with at night or to read at night, there would be this flicker, and it would be difficult, right, because the wick had not been tended. That was the idea. It's a wick in need of care. It's a reed that's been bruised, and yet he doesn't break that reed, and he doesn't quench that flame. He tends the wick. He restores the fallen. That's the idea. Pulpit commentary says it this way. He knows when the poor heart is well nigh crushed with grief at its departure from him. It's even giving the reason why it's crushed and why it's smoldering. It's crushed with grief at its departure from him. And he does not delight in our pain. See, this is a different kind of leader. It's a different kind of ruler. Maybe in Sunday school you talked about that idea. Maybe you talked about that idea of how he leads, how Christ leads and how his leadership is different than the typical ruler. You have to think about what these people had just come from. They had come from a Babylonian emperor, a Medio-Persian emperor, right? And what does that, what does that person do? What does that person on the throne do? They seem to thrive on pain. Doesn't go my way? Off with their heads, right? To be in that place of power where there's no check on that authority, you will do what I say. Imagine future generations reading this and thinking about how cruel Rome was to them, the oppression that they felt under the Roman Empire. The passage is saying he doesn't lead. When you're down, he doesn't, kick, he doesn't desire to see you fail. He's not looking to zap you with a lightning bolt. He's looking to offer grace. He's looking to, to extend his grace to us. Dean Stanley says, in the foreground of the future stands not the ruler or the conqueror, but a servant of God, which is what's being described here, right? Now, that's not to say he doesn't have power because we've already mentioned it a little bit in verse 4. He will establish justice on the earth. He will make all things right. But the idea is, is that when we look at that personality that's described, we can't establish justice on the earth, but we should desire to see his justice come, Right? Maybe apart from that, when you look at the other things that are on the list, when you think about how we are to serve God, think about how that should be with the purpose that he's called us to, empowered by the Spirit, in obedience, so that he's delighting in what we're doing and how we're serving him, not in a flamboyant way, but with this humble consistency that shares the message, not just by crying in the streets, but by our very devotion and our lives to him in a way that extends grace to those who need it. This is what he's calling us to. It's the personality that's described, the personality that should look like him. I've got to hurry. Let's focus on verses five through seven. You see in that first bit the personality that's described, but let's look secondly at the purpose that's prescribed. What, what is the purpose? What, what is the purpose that's given to the servant of God? There again, think back to the term servant. Why use the term servant? Why not, why not use king of kings, lord of lords, that idea, right? It's back to this idea that, that God the Son is accomplishing the purposes of God the Father. You know how this idea of a servant, if you think about how a king then might lean on a trusted advisor and might, might call them to to enact or to work or to do, and he doesn't need us. The Lord doesn't rely on us, but he calls us to serve in order to accomplish his purposes. And it would be through the ministry of the servant of God where we would see the light come to the nations, where we would see the gospel, where we would find salvation in the servant of God. I like verse 5. Verse 5 to me doesn't fit with verses 6 and 7 as well. So I start looking at it and I start thinking about why verse 5 before verses 6 and 7. One of the things that I thought about is verse 5. This is the Lord who created the heavens, who stretched them out, who spread out the earth. God as creator 
had a strategic plan and an order to his creation. And the same is true when it came to salvation. There was this order to it, right? It did not catch him by surprise, the fall in the garden. That's why immediately after that, he's already giving hints of the gospel in his words of punishment to Adam and Eve. So we're already seeing, in the first few chapters of the Bible, we're already seeing pictures of this redemption story because not only is his creation strategic and ordered, his plan for salvation is as well. And this beautiful truth lets me know that I'm a part of that plan and you are too because it turns in verse 6 very personal. This God who created the heavens, I am the Lord and I have called you in righteousness and I will take you by the hand. And the verses say in verses 6 and 7, I'm going to do this. I'm going to personally be involved with you and I'm going to bring salvation. I'm going to bring freedom. I'm going to bring light. I'm going to take those that are prisoners and I'm going to set them free. I'm going to be a light to the nations and I'm going to open the eyes of the blind. Now, I believe that what's being described here is not so much physical as it is spiritual, right? Yes, when Jesus came, he touched the eyes of the blind and they saw, right? You could even take that, that idea of the, the prisoners being set free. Remember Paul and Silas? I mean, we could go to these stories and we could say, he has done these things physically. But it's not about him doing them physically. If we are servants of his and we are to proclaim the message of what he has done for us, how he has brought us out of darkness into marvelous light, that's the picture that you and I were enslaved and imprisoned in our sin, helpless and hopeless. And we could not see the way. And only through him were our eyes opened and did the chains fall off. And we now live in freedom, Galatians 5. We now live in freedom that he has given to us, right? And we now see because he has, he has opened our eyes and he has, the light of the world has, has shone on us, John 1, right? This idea. This idea that he has, he has opened our eyes and we spiritually see this is the freedom that comes in him. What he's describing is the purpose that he comes for is to bring salvation. And I would say to you this morning that if you think about your own life and your own life seems to be this prison of darkness... He offers freedom from that. He breaks chains. The things that we seem to be bound by, he breaks them. That's what's being described in this passage. And this morning, if you don't know him, in a moment, there'll be time for us to respond to that. And I would say, come to him. The whole reason that I'm standing here, the whole reason that I'm asking you to speak to 100 people this year is we are called to share the message of the gospel. The purpose of the church, the reason why we are here, the reason that, we are to, to, that God is using us is to make disciples. That's the mission of the church, to tell the world that Jesus saves. And if we are servants of his, everything we do will be geared toward that. And I want you to hear me very carefully. I'm not asking you to take on 100 people as a project. That's not, what I, that's not what I want you to do, and that's not what those 100 people want you to do for them. You need to be genuinely invested in the lives of people, not as a means of manipulation, but you do that recognizing that they need Jesus. Let's just be honest. There's been times where I have maintained friendships that I wouldn't maintain because me and that person don't have a lot in common. But you know what I know? I know that they need the gospel and they need to see me often so that there's opportunities to be able to share the gospel because God may use somebody else, but God could use me and God could be wanting to use me. And everything that I, when I think about the purpose that's given, the purpose that's prescribed, the purpose that's directed for the church is to make disciples. And we will never do that if we are isolated in a box with only the people we know, the only people we're familiar with, only people that know the gospel. We must develop those friendships. We must reach outside of that in order to be able to share. 
I've got to hurry. Personality that's described, purpose that's prescribed. Lastly, I want you to see the power that is ascribed to him. In verses 8 and 9, the conclusion of this song says, I am the Lord. That's my name. And I don't give my glory to anybody else. This is the power of God. It is apparent. It is so apparent that the power of God can do what idols cannot. It is so apparent that God's glory stands apart. It stands ab- It cannot be shared with an idol or something that men have created. Now, this is a statement, I think, directed toward the idea that Israel had chosen idols over him. I think that's why it's being mentioned here. But this is a perfect image for me and you, right? Isn't it interesting that God speaks about his power here, but he also speaks about it in that Great Commission passage. Remember that? The Great Commission doesn't start with go and make disciples of all men. When we read those Great Commission verses in verse 18, he says, all power has been given unto me. That's how Jesus starts. All power has been given unto me. Verse 19. Therefore, because all power is mine, go and make disciples, baptizing them teaching them all things that I've commanded you. All power is mine. Therefore, you go. And what does the last verse say? King James. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. My power is with you. I have all this power. Not the power that you talk about with idols. It's not even the same ballpark. It's not even the same sport. I am God. They are not. I am God. I have the power. All power is mine. And because all power is mine, you need to go. Because I'm powerful, you go. You don't disobey my command. I'm God. All power is given unto me. Therefore, I'm saying go. So what should we do? When you go, don't be afraid of whatever you find out there. Because all power is mine. And lo, I'm with you always, even into the end of the age. I'm there with you. I'm equipping you for the very thing I'm calling you to do. Go. Go and make disciples. Do this thing that I'm asking you to do. Now, what you to understand, you and I do, when we think about this comparison with what's going on in this text, you and I do not have the same power that he has. In other words, he is creator. We are creation. In one sense, we don't have the power that he has, right? In another sense, we do. Because he has equipped us and he has put his Holy Spirit in us. And as the book of Romans says, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that's living and operating in you right now. It's the same power that will allow you to be equipped for the challenge that I'm giving you. To go and to make disciples and to share the gospel with the nations. We should honor him because of his power. And we should live in the power of his spirit. I only have a few minutes today, and I want to tell you a story to close. Because what I've shared is this comparison of his, of how we can serve as he does. It's revealing Christ as the, as the servant in this passage, and then it's showing how we can kind of do what he does. We can, we can operate as he does, use him as an example. But in the culture that we live, people balk at being servants. They don't want to serve. But you know, that's what we're called to do. G.K. Chesterton Chesterton tells this story in um, Tremendous Trifles. It's a wonderful little story about two boys who are playing in their yard. And it's a very small yard. You know, he's, uh, you know, he's British, so it's a garden. You know, they're in the garden. And he says it's a very small little yard that they play in. And he describes it, the flowers that are there, the flower beds that are there, the patch of grass. He describes the, you know, the, all of that. And then he says that these two boys playing in the, in the yard and this person walks by. And this person begins to talk to the boys. And the person ends up being a fairy who makes a proposition to them that he will grant them any wish that they have. Well, the first boy says, you know what I've always wanted to be is a giant. If I were a giant... I could just stroll around this world 
and I could go and I could see Niagara Falls, and I could go and I could see the Himalayas, and I, it would be nothing. I just on an evening stroll, I could go and see these wonders if I were a giant. And so, you know what happens, right? He becomes a giant. The story rolls on. He, he does go to the Himalayas. Well, when he gets there, those mountains seem pretty small. Nothing like he'd been told. They were just little hills. And when he went to Niagara Falls, it was just like somebody had turned the faucet on in the tub. It was not really that impressive at all. Story says he lays down on four or five prairies to take a nap. A woodsman comes out. The woodsman's reading. And then the, 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 the woodsman reads from a book. I want to make sure that I get this right because I put this in my notes. In the book it said, because it goes to the heart of the story, it doesn't matter that the woodsman reads it. Eventually the woodsman going to cut his head off. But the woodsman reads from the book that says... It can be maintained that the evil of pride consists in being out of proportion to the universe. He's a giant, and the woodsman does what they do in fairy tales, and he cuts the head of, off the giant, and the boy dies. It's not a story for children. <laughs> oh, come on, it's so cool, Easton. So... The second little boy, he makes right the opposite wish. He says, I've often wondered what it would be to, a pygmy, to be a pygmy. In fact, I wish that I was only about a half an inch high. And as the story goes, Barry grants his request, and he's transported to this jungle. It, everything's green, and when he looks, he can see these uh, huge flowers in the distance. And these mountains of gravel. And it's like the, the description that G.K. Chesterton gives, which he didn't know it was honey, I shrunk the kids, you know. That's what he's describing. is how this yard becomes this huge, adventurous place. And then he sets out on it. And the, the story ends with G.K. Chesterton saying that, that, that he, he went out to find adventure and he has not found the end of it yet. The story's not about boys who get turned into giants and who get turned into little dwarves. That's not what the story's about. The story is about being in proportion with your universe. The person who says, I can't be a servant, has said, I'm too great for these servant things. Look at how wonderful I am. I, I am like one of God's MVPs. Are you kidding me? I can't be called to this servant stuff. That person is out of proportion with their universe. Hmm. But the one who recognizes that we are this big, that's where the adventure's at. What would happen if we this year said, I will humbly take the role of a servant like my Lord? In my mind, will be the same mind that was in Christ Jesus who humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross. And I will serve as the servant of God serves. What would happen? Lord, this morning we want to be in proportion to you. We want to clearly see how we stand against your might and your majesty. And Lord, I believe that's the only prayer that I need to pray for us. Because I believe that, that, that by praying that, the one that's here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, the one that's here that is living in rebellion to you, Lord, I believe that when they see their self in proportion to you, they will turn to you. They will repent of their sins and they will turn to you. They'll come to you. The one who can bring light to darkness. The one who can break the prison chains. Lord, I pray for the one who knows you today, and I believe that that prayer, by praying to be in proportion with you, that, Lord, by doing so, that, Lord, we even as believers are able to, able to see our role that you have called us to and where you would have us to serve. Lord, don't let us wander astray right now. Keep our attention on you and help us to be obedient, leaving here with hearts that are ready to serve. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.